I don't know about you this evening, but I, I suddenly feel weak and unstable. So, um, But this evening, I, <clears throat> I'd like us to examine the testimony of John the Baptist as, as recorded in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, 19 to 34, um, that Quinn read, read earlier. And, and the Gospel's written by John the Apostle, so we're going to be using a lot of Johns this evening. John the Baptist's testimony as recorded in the Gospel of John, which was written by John the Apostle. All right. If I get my Johns wrong, um, just excuse me for that. I'm sure you can work it out. But my <clears throat> my hope is that tonight we can we can glean some godly wisdom from John the Baptist as it pertains to the focus and the attitude that we should have as we all live out our own calling in service to our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And before we before we get into verse 19, though, in the opening 18 verses of chapter one, the Apostle John has really presented to us this fantastic theological treatise on the nature of Christ. Okay, and it's, it's so rich and dense, and I, I encourage you to read it. But John's purpose in writing is not only to give theology on Christ's nature and life. His purpose in writing is so that people would repent and believe in Jesus. And he states this for himself in, in chapter 20, verse 1. John spells out his purpose for writing this gospel. He says, these things that are written, so everything written before chapter 20, he says, these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And so John the Apostle's purpose in writing the gospel of John is evangelistic. And so with this in mind, we see that very early on in his gospel, John the Apostle begins with the testimony of John the Baptist concerning Jesus. In fact, he, he includes some snippets of it in, that fir- in the first 18 verses anyway. But from, from verse 19, he really gets into the testimony of John the Baptist. And we don't get a lot of history of John the Baptist in, in the Gospel of John. We, we can get that from some of the other Gospels, um, some more about John's life. And just to locate um, verse 19 in kind of the timeline of John's life, we we learn from the other Gospels that before the account that we're going to look at, at tonight, before that account happens, John the Baptist has already been preaching a message of repentance in preparation of the coming Messiah. All right? He's been preaching this message, repent, for the kingdom of God is near. We see that he's become really popular. All right? Matthew, Matthew 3 tells us in verse 5, that Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him, to John the Baptist, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Right? All the people were going out to him. Right? He was preaching this message of repentance. People were coming to hear it, and many of them were being baptized by John. We also know from the other Gospels that before we get to John 1.19, that John the Baptist has already baptized Jesus. Right? And he's seen and he's heard the proof from God that Jesus is the Son of God and the Messiah. And so with that as context, let's pick up the account of John the Baptist's testimony in verse 19 of John chapter 1. And firstly, we see a question. Verse 19 says, And this is the testimony of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? And the first thing we see here is that priests and Levites are sent to inquire about John's identity by the Jews. Okay, interesting, interesting phrase there. But it's a phrase that John uses. He uses it over 70 times, I think, in, in the gospel. And it doesn't have any ethnic overtones for John. He simply uses the term to describe the religious leaders of the day. And so we know that the religious leaders have sent the priests and the Levites to where John is preaching and baptizing people to find out who is this man that is getting so popular. Right? And if you read down to verse 24 quickly, you'll see that indeed it was the Pharisees who sent these priests and Levites to John. And we know that the Pharisees are, are primarily politically motivated. They, they're not that spiritually motivated when we read their, their accounts in, in the gospel. Some of them, a small, small minority are, but as, as a block, they're really politically motivated. And I think they probably want to know John's identity because he is getting so popular. Right? After all, it's, it's kind of... It's their voting block that are now flocking to this guy to hear what, he, what he's got to say. And I think it's worrying them. All right? And in Matthew chapter 3, <clears throat> we learn of a criticism that John the Baptist levels against the Pharisees. And he calls them a brood of vipers. It's basically saying, you're, bud, you're a snake. Okay? okay? You're a snake. 
He also tells them to start bearing fruit in keeping with righteousness. And the implication being that they are not righteous. And so these are the people sending the priests to ask the question of John, who are you? And I think John knows that their question is, is political rather than spiritually motivated, not coming from a sincere desire to know, to know John and to know what his ministry is, because he answers them by not telling them who he is. He answers them by telling them who he is not. They say, John, who are you? He says, I am not the Christ. And he's basically saying, I am not the king. That's essentially what he's saying. So they say, who are you? And he goes, look, I'm not the king. All right? I'm not the king. And so he gives this answer. And, and there's an interesting phrase there in verse 20. It says, he confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. He confessed and did not deny, but confessed. And it's a strange phrase in English, but it basically means to forcefully say the thing that is true. Okay? And so John forcefully said the thing that is true when, he, when the priest asked him, who are you? He forcefully said what is true. I am not Christ. All right? He knows that. He knows that. The, Greek, the, the word that we translate Christ here comes from the Greek word Christos, which comes from the Hebrew word Meshayach, which we translate as Messiah. Same word, Christos, Christ, Meshayach, Messiah. It means the anointed one, and it's most often used to describe the king of Israel. And so what John is telling these politically motivated people, I know what you're after here. You want to know, am I, am I the Messiah? Am I the king of Israel? And he flat out just says, no, I'm not. I'm not the king of Israel. The Jews are looking for a king. They're looking for a Messiah, as we heard this morning from 2 Samuel 7. And Tommy explained that they've been looking for this one descended from David who will rule forever. Are you the one, John? They ask him. And he says, no, I'm not the promised descendant of David who will rule forever. And I think John is basically telling them, look, I'm not the one you should be concerned with. All right? I'm, I'm not the leader of this. I'm not the focus of what's going on here. Yeah, you're seeing crowds and you're worried about it, but stop questioning me. I'm not the focus. All right? I'm not pulling the strings here. I'm not the one in control of what is happening here. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then the priests and the Levites go on in verse 21 and they seek further clarification. Well, you're not the Messiah, so they ask him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. I think John is losing his patience here because his answers keep getting shorter and shorter. You know, they say, who are you? He says, I am not the Christ. There's a few words in there. Are you Elijah? I'm not. Um, are you the prophet? He goes, no. Okay, I think he's, he's getting a little bit curt to them. All right? But they ask him, are you Elijah? And perhaps they're thinking of Malachi 4, 5, and 6 where it's prophesied that Elijah will come back before the great and awesome day of the Lord. Remember, they're waiting for the Messiah. All right. And now they see one that resembles Elijah a little bit. You know, they both wore weird clothes. They both kind of came out from the desert. They're both bold, taking on the leaders of the day. Okay. Are you Elijah? Elijah's arguably the greatest prophet, and he didn't die physically. So maybe John the Baptist is Elijah. Are you him, John? I'm not. Scripture tells us in Luke 1 that John the Baptist would have the spirit and power of Elijah. Okay, but John the Baptist is crystal clear that he is not Elijah come back to earth. All right, he says, No, I'm not. They move on, they ask him, Are you the prophet? Okay, and he says, No, I'm not the prophet. You'll see in your Bibles that the word prophet there is in capital letters, and it's a reference to Deuteronomy 18 15 to 19. Moses speaks of a great prophet that will arise from among his brothers that everyone will listen to. We know that Moses was spe speaking about Jesus. I'm not too sure the Jews of that time knew that yet. Um, Acts 3.22, Peter makes it very clear that that reference in Deuteronomy is about Christ. But again, they ask him, are you him, John? Are you this great prophet? No. Are you the Messiah? Are you Elijah? Are you the prophet? John the Baptist answers no to each of those. And finally, they let him speak. And so in verse 22, we see that the priests and Levites say to John the Baptist, okay, you tell us then, who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? Give an answer to those who sent us. It's always amazed me how much power the religious leaders had in Jewish society that they could send the priests and the Levites on this errand. You know what I mean? Like run along and find out for us and then come back and, and report to us. All right. But finally, they're going to let John the Baptist explain for himself 
Who are you, John the Baptist? You tell us in your own words who you are. Here's what John could have said. He could have said, I'm a great preacher. I mean, look around you. I'm able to draw massive crowds. Could have said that. Could have said, hey, I'm the last Old Testament prophet and the first New Testament preacher. That would have been, that would have been perfectly accurate as well. He could have said, I'm the son of Zacharias, the esteemed priest in Jerusalem. Could have said that. Would have been true. He could have said, I'm a man who is filled with the Holy Spirit in the womb. Would have been true. He could have said, you know this Messiah you're looking for? I baptized him. Could have said that. Would have been true. He doesn't say that though. John's answer to who are you, he quotes from Isaiah 43 to 5, which is in reference to him. And in verse 23, we see, we see that John the Baptist said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. I'm a voice. I'm just a voice. That's what he said. That's me. You want to know who I am? I'm simply a voice proclaiming a message, repent in preparation for the king. I'm not him. I'm just a voice. I'm just a voice. All the region is coming to him. So much so that the leaders of the day get worried and send people to find out. And what does this man say? He says, I'm nobody. I'm just a voice telling you to prepare for Jesus. John knew his voice is temporary. A voice is always fleeting, it's always fading. We know that. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust, we all know where we're going. Our voices are fading, they are fleeting. John knows this and it's his view of himself. I'm merely a fading voice that is crying out in the wilderness. And so the priests and the Levites are standing there going, well, you're not the Messiah, you're not Elijah, you're not the great prophet, and I don't know, you're some kind of voice. And, and now they get to this kind of question of authority, and they asked him, then why are you baptizing if you're neither the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? And John answered them, I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know, even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. John basically tells them, you think I'm claiming some kind of authority here? You think that I think I'm something. I'm not like you. I don't think like that. All right, You think I think that I'm something. Let me tell you that there is one among you, and you don't know him yet, but there's one among you, and I'm not even worthy of untying his sandals. My ministry, my service, my witness is nothing compared to him. My character, my life is nothing compared to him. I'm nothing, and he is everything. Don't concern yourself with me, priests and Levites. Look to him. I think that's what John's telling in there. There had not been a prophet in Israel for 400 years until John the Baptist. Man, if that was me, I'd have an ego, which is probably why I'm not John the Baptist. But, you know, there hasn't been a prophet in Israel for 400 years Jesus calls John the Baptist the greatest man born of a woman. People are flocking to hear him speak and responding to his message. And when asked who he thinks he is, he says, I'm just a voice pointing people to Jesus. And I'm unworthy to even perform the lowest of servant duties on him. That's what he says about himself. Now in verse 29, we see we get to the next day. All right. And so... Verse kind of 19 to 28 all happen on one day. And the next day, John accurately identifies Jesus as the Lamb of God who will take away the sins of the world. And, and in verse 29 and following, we have this great statement from John. And we, we can pick it up in verse 29. It says, The next day he, John the Baptist, saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove and it remained on him. 
I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and borne witness that this is the Son of God. A day earlier, John, John's telling the priests and the Levites that there's one among you, and I'm unworthy of even untying his sandals. And now Jesus comes towards John. And John accurately can point, at Jesus, can point Jesus out and say, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. One of the great statements of the New Testament. Jesus is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And, and the image of the sacrificial lamb, we can think of Passover in the Old Testament, evident in texts such as Isaiah 53, Genesis 22, where Abraham's statement regarding God's provision of a lamb. But maybe, maybe for the people that heard, G, heard John make that statement, behold the lamb of God, they're probably thinking of the atonement lamb that would be sacrificed by the priests every year on the Day of Atonement. So we can't be certain of John's specific intention or illusion when he says that, but there's no doubt that for John that Jesus is the fulfillment of all the ancient sacrifices that foreshadows his sacrificial death. And so he calls him the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. But he also recognizes that Jesus ranks before him. Um, John recognizes that he is just preparing the way and that Jesus is the one with the power to save. The one who can baptize in the Holy Spirit, can truly save. John bears witness to the fact that Jesus is the Son of God. Now, now we don't see from this passage if the priests and Levites are still hanging around on day two of this. All right? Remember, we're now in the next day. And I don't know if they hung around for verse 29 to 34, but... If they were, I, I imagine John would tell them something like, you, you think my ministry should be considered worthy of attention because people are showing their willingness to repent and, and get in the water. You know? But there walks the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world and can baptize people with the Holy Spirit. Why are you even looking at me? There walks true authority and power. The service I've been called to pales in comparison to what he will do. I can call for repentance, John might have told them, but only he can forgive sin and change people's hearts. Only he can do that. Stop worrying about me. Concern yourself with the true king who can save you and fill you with the Holy Spirit. Concern yourself with the Christ. Concern yourself with the chosen one of the Father, the beloved of God, the Son of God, the Lamb of God. Concern yourself with him. I am. I'm nothing but a voice. I think maybe John could have said something like that to them. <clears throat> so we spend some time going through this passage. And I forgot to put my time on. But we, we spend some time going through this passage briefly together. And I made no outline points as we went through it. And I'll probably have my Baptist membership card taken away now. But... <clears throat> I want to make one, one point this evening by way of application. Just, just one point. I, I think those verses speak for themselves. But yeah, here's my point for us tonight. Is, is that John refused. John refused to make himself the purpose or focus of his witness and service. That's what he did. He refused to make himself the purpose or focus of his witness and service. John had the opportunity to elevate himself. But he doesn't. Not once. He doesn't. And whatever service the Lord is calling you to, with whatever gifts that he has blessed you with, we need to humbly serve with the same attitude that John the Baptist had. I'm just a voice. Don't look to me. Behold the Lamb of God. And I think that's got to be true in our homes, at church, at school, at work, at play. The simple truth is, is that Christ must be the focus of all we are and do because he is the only worthy one. He is the only worthy one. And yes, I, I think we should strive to perform our service with excellence. All right? I honestly believe we should do that as excellently as we can because, because Christ deserves our all. But our attitude must be that others will behold the Lamb of God and not us. Behold the Lamb of God. The purpose and focus of our lives is Christ and our witness is to point others to him, not to ourselves. Never to ourselves. 
In closing, look at John 1, verse 35 to 37. The next day, so now we're on the third day of this passage. The next day, again, John was standing with two of his disciples. Okay, these are his disciples. And he looked at Jesus as Jesus walked by. And again, he says, behold, the Lamb of God. And those two disciples heard him say this, and they stayed with John. No. His two disciples heard him say, look, behold the Lamb of God. And what happened? John's disciples followed Jesus. They followed Jesus. Later in John the Baptist's ministry, you can, you can read that in John 3. Some of his disciples will come to John and mention to him that, look, Jesus is also baptizing, and a whole lot of people are going to him. You know? And John, John approves, and he says, that's right. He must increase, and I must decrease. He must increase, and I must decrease. May we have the same attitude, and may God grant us the joy of seeing many people turning from sin and becoming disciples of Jesus.